This is the video key for the Unit 2 take-home test. Please make sure as you're using this video key, you're using it helpfully. Okay? You use it to correct your work. You will learn more from fixing a mistake that you made than from getting the answer from this video. So try and make sure you're using this the right way. There are 10 points of extra credit hidden in this video. If you watch the whole thing, you can get those. Anything you see highlighted in green is something we're going to do together in this video. Anything that you see highlighted in yellow, I'm going to leave for you to try on your own. All right? So let's look at our vocabulary for this unit. Really important vocabulary. The whole point of our electron configuration is telling us where electrons are arranged. So the periodic table being pulled apart in this way is showing us where those electrons are in terms of levels and sublevels. Ground states, okay. We'll look at this one. An atom's blank is a measure of how much it wants additional electrons. Okay, number, well, I guess the next one. The blank energy is the amount of attraction an atom has for its own electrons. So these two concepts are very, very similar, but we need to be able to tell them apart. Okay, so both ionization and electronegativity are about attraction to electrons. The difference is an atom's attraction to its own electrons. How much it wants to keep what it already has is IE, ionization energy. How much an atom wants additional electrons or extra electrons is electronegativity. So an atom's blank is a measure of how much it wants someone else's electrons. Extra electrons would be electronegativity. Oh, almost fit in there. Okay. And the amount of attraction it has for its electrons, the ones it already has, i.e., is ionization energy, i.e. Okay. So that gets us to there. Find those other ones on your own. Okay. Hopefully, we're pretty good with electron configuration by the time we're looking at this video tutorial. Otherwise, go back and look at some of the other homework ones. Um, we're going to do oxygen together. So I'm going to get out my little sparkly placeholders. Okay. If oxygen is the point of the problem, I'm going to put one there so I know I'm stopping at electron 8. And I'm going to put one here to show me where I'm at. Okay. So the electron arrangement, the electron configuration, is that the first two electrons, if I go to the end of that block, are both in the 1s orbital. So I would say the first two electrons are in 1s, like this. Okay. After electron 1, 2, we talk about 3 and 4. And those are the two electrons in 2s. The two electrons in, oopsies, 2s, that's why I wrote in pencil. After 4, I don't come to 11. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, I'm going to say these last four electrons, 5, 6, 7, and 8, P4, are the four electrons in 2P. So if you add up those superscripts, okay, 2 plus, oopsies, wow, 2 plus 2 plus 4, those are where oxygen's eight electrons are arranged. The difference for noble gas notation, then, is that's our shortcut. I'm allowed to take a noble gas as a shortcut. So this is not the alkali metal shortcut. This is not the halogen shortcut. It's the noble gas shortcut. So it has to be from one of the noble gases, which are family 18 on the periodic table. I'm just going to turn this over and remind you that helium is part of family 18, even though it's in the S block. So I moved it over here. Okay. So if potassium is where we're going, it's 19 electrons, what's the biggest shortcut I can take? Well, noble gas 2 would be a shortcut. I could say noble gas 10 or noble gas 18. I couldn't take an, a shortcut from noble, noble gas 36, though, because we're not there. So I'm going to say, okay, argon is going to be my shortcut. I'm going to start from there and write the symbol of only a noble gas, a R, and that represents the first 18 electrons. And then I say what comes after 18? 19. 
and potassium's 19th electron is in 4s1. So that shows me my 18 electrons that are like argon, plus one more, is 19 electrons. Full arrangement, noble gas shortcut. Orbital notation, then, is what we're looking at with the arrows. Don't use arrows for anything else. But we use the arrows to represent electrons, and we use them in opposite spins, okay, which is one of your vocab from the top of this page. They have to be in the opposite direction, according to the Pauli exclusion principle, if you want to feel fancy. Okay. So sodium is where we're going. Sodium's 11 electrons, and I would say the first two are in 1s. So sodium's first two electrons are in 1s. Now I've seen a lot of my students this year on homework write 1s2 like that. Technically that's not included in this notation, but I don't think we'd mark you wrong for putting it there. But s's have one orbital per sublevel, so we'll go like that. The next two electrons are in 2s, so anytime I put an s orbital, I get one. Okay. Now, I don't go 1, 2, 3, 4, 11, 12. No, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 over here. So then I'm going to 2p. And our s, p, d, f have 1, 3, 5, 7 orbitals or bedrooms. So if I write the letter p, I'm going to put 1, 2, 3 orbitals after it. Okay? After electron 10, we come over here to 11, and that's in 3s. So I'm going to come back with my arrows and say 1s2 would be an up and a down arrow, because they'll share an, orbital, <laughs> share an orbital with opposite spin. 2s2, up, down. 2p6, we say up, up, up. That's Hun's rule. Each electron will get its own orbital before it has to share. Opposite, down, down, down. And then we stop at 3s1 for sodium right here. 3s1. There's only one electron there. So if we count our arrows, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 arrows are our sodium's 11 electrons. That's how we represent them. Okay. I want to look at what it is in multiple choice form. And I tell my students this all the time, whether I'm teaching ACT prep classes or chemistry, take out the garbage. Okay, we want to eliminate wrong answers. That's our best bet on multiple choice tests of any subject. Okay, people, seriously. Noble gas notation for nickel. Nickel is NI, it's number 28. It was on your symbols list, so hopefully you know that one. Okay, the noble gas shortcut would have to be from a noble gas. If we're going talking about 28 electrons for nickel, I can't take a shortcut from 36 electrons. So argon is going to be where I take my shortcut from, which means I can come through and take out some garbage. I can't take a shortcut from, from Kr. can't take a shortcut from Kr. So I take out the garbage. Those are garbage answers. I know my shortcut is going to be from argon. Let me grab a different color here. Okay. I know it's going to be from argon, but I don't pick the first argon I see. I have to make sure which one's right. So after electron 18, I have to come and talk about 19 and 20, because we count in order, low to high. 19 and 20 are in 4s2, but this one doesn't have 4s2, which makes me think it's wrong. After 4s2, then I go to 3d8. So I took out my three garbage answers. That left me with my most correct answer there. Do the same process for 6, 7, and 8. And take a look at what we did on the bottom of page or number 9 there. Okay. If you need more time on that, rewind it, pause it. Otherwise, let's move to page 2. Okay. Current model of the atom right there. Some other stuff for you at the top of the page. But let's look at 12 and 13. So number 12 says the electron configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p2 belongs to the element blank. So I highlighted 2p2 because the last orbital gives us our biggest hint about what element we're talking about. Because the electron 2p 
and P2 would be electron 6, which is carbon. So I can pretty confidently say, well, that belongs to carbon. Okay, now be careful. It is not in group P2, right? But to turn our periodic table over to see the group and period numbers here. So groups, do not forget. Whoops, and you know what? I wrote this in the wrong spot, didn't I? I meant to write it here. There we go. I'm doing number 12. Groups run vertically, and periods are horizontally. Don't get those backwards. Carbon is in group 14 or 4A. If you wrote 4, you'd be wrong, because that's titanium's group is group 4. Carbon is 14 or 4A only. And it's in period, let's see, 2, right there. For number 13, the electron configuration notation for, again, I'm just going to pay attention to that last one that they tell me, <clears throat> 3P5. And I'll move over to this side. 3P5, right there, that would be electron 17, which is chlorine. So I'd say chlorine. I know it's not fluorine, because that would be 2P5. Bromine would be 4P5. Calcium's 4S2. That's definitely not it. Okay, so there's my answer. Okay, we're going to look at 16 and 17. A couple things that are a little bit nasty about number 16. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I had someone pronounce this Aruba this year. True story cracks me up. It's Offbaugh's principle. You do not need to know that Offbaugh's principle says electrons fill up from low to high energy, but you just need to know that it's breaking a rule. Which of the following is incorrect? Which of the following is breaking some kind of rule? The other thing that gets hard about this is it's a lot of stuff squished together. Okay, um, So we're going to compare them vertically, compare them to each other. A, B, C, and D all start with 1s2. So I can pretty confidently say that's not going to help me. They all say 2s2. They all say 2p6. They all say 3s2. Now C is over. That is just fine, because that means C is magnesium, Mg. It's not wrong. It's just a smaller element. Okay. Then they all say 3p6. They all say 4s2. And then, uh-oh, this one says 4P5 next. Okay, I can't go from 4S2, which is 20, to 4P5, which is 31 through 35. So that one skipped all of our 3Ds. So I'd say this one skipped the 3Ds. It's breaking a rule, so this one is breaking off Bos principle, or this one looks incorrect. 17 sometimes freaks people out, but 17 is almost the same question as 13. Okay, Where instead of saying 1s2, 2s2, we did 1s2 arrows, 2s2 arrows. So again, we only need to key on the last orbital, 3p1, and 3p1 belongs to aluminum down here, 3p1. So what element is it? I would say Al, aluminum. Okay. The rest of this page, important vocabulary. Um, I'm going to offer our first little bit of extra credit right here for number 19. If you draw this, number 19 says this orbital notation right here correct, correctly represents the valence electrons of group blank. This is the exact same as if in unit two I had said this Lewis dot structure correctly represents what group? Because we're only talking about valence electrons. And I think most people got that one right. Where I would say one, two, three dots means group 13 or 3A. One, two, three arrows means group 13 or 3A. Because they have three valence electrons. So go ahead, put a box, put plus two extra credit there and draw in the Lewis dot structure to compare it. Number 20, what group on the periodic table does this valence orbital notation represent? Okay, and I drew this Lewis dot structure as well. 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dots, just like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven arrows. Seven valence electrons would belong to group 17 or 7a. The halogens, I could also say. Very similar to what you're going to go ahead and do on 21, the same type of process. Okay, sorry, I was trying to get that focused. For 23, we're using the other side of the periodic table now. It says, which of these elements has the largest atomic radius? So boron, gallium, aluminum, indium. I'm going to look at this side of that green periodic table. You get one like this, not yours, not your copy, but you get one like this on your test. And I'm going to find those four elements. And I like to cut up little pieces of paper because you can't write on your test copy. So your elements were boron, aluminum, gallium, and indium, I think. Let me double check that. I can't have both on the screen. Boron, gallium, aluminum, indium. Yep. So they're asking you, <laughs> sorry, for largest atomic radius. So I'm only going to pay attention to my atomic radius arrows. Big fat francium has the biggest atomic radius on the periodic table. So the closer you are to francium, the larger your atomic radius is. So it increases as you move down the group. So of these, which one would have the largest? I'd follow the arrow and say this one. Indium would have the largest atomic radius because it's in period 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's going to have five energy levels to it. Indium would have the largest atomic radius. Well, 24 is using the same skill set, but now we're looking at this ionization energy arrows, okay, or these ionization energy arrows. Sodium, let me get them on here and then I'll show you. Sodium, chlorine, um, wait, which one? Silicon, sorry, and magnesium, okay. So for highest ionization energy, sodium, chlorine, silicon, like that. Well, ionization energy is largest as you get towards helium. Remember, ionization energy is the attraction an atom has for its electrons. These guys over here do not want to give away their electrons. They have very high ionization energies. So you get largest as you go this way towards helium, which would be chlorine is the furthest following that arrow. So chlorine would have the highest ionization energy. As you do 22 and 25, remember that smallest to largest. Okay, don't get those ones backwards. And that's page two. Let's move to page three. Oops, sorry. On page three, I'm offering some more extra credit for you here. Okay, what I did was I drew how you'd know atomic radius. So I drew the box plus two, and then I drew a circle. Radius and geometry and radius and chemistry are the same. The middle of a circle to the outside edge of a circle. But in an atom, the middle of a circle is the nucleus, the middle of an atom, and the outermost part of an atom are the valence electrons. So number 27 says the blank blank is the distance between the nucleus and the valence electrons. You need to have your brain picture this when you read something like that. And you'd say, oh yeah, that's the radius, the atom radius, or atomic radius. So yes, you need to be able to read these arrows, okay? But you also need to know what each of those three things means. Good. Um, I answered some of these ones for you. Take a look at 28 if you couldn't figure it out, or if you made a mistake on it. You can go ahead and change your answers, okay? For number 29, it says fill in the valence electrons for nitrogen. So just like our Lewis dot structure, we want to figure out how many valence electrons nitrogen has. Nitrogen's right here in family 15 or 5a, so it's going to have five dots if it was Lewis dot structure, or five arrows if it's orbitals like this. So the first two dots go together, up and down, in that first orbital. Just like if we were drawing nitrogen's Lewis dot structure, we'd say the first two dots go together, and then three, four, five by themselves. So up, 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 three, four, five by themselves. Because Hund's rule says they want to spread out into their own orbitals. Okay, remember neon's a noble gas. I gave you a hint to do number 31 on your own. And then um, I showed you how I did 32, okay? 
An atom of fluorine more strongly attracts electrons in a bond than calcium because fluorine has higher blank than calcium. Okay. Well, first of all, resonance, D right here, that is a chemistry term, but that is not, well, I haven't taught you that. That means it's garbage. Get rid of it. <laughs> okay. Um, fluorine and calcium, it doesn't have a bigger atomic radius. It does have bigger electronegativity and ionization energy. Okay, fluorine has more electronegativity and more ionization energy. But if we're talking about electrons in a bond, we're talking about E extra electrons, which means E electronegativity. All right, let's look at, so you can see how I did 33. I showed you my work on 34. Compared to the atomic radius of potassium, so I'm going to put a little thing over here on potassium on my periodic table. I'll show you it in a second. The atomic radius of calcium is blank. Okay, let's stop there. So compared to potassium, calcium would be blank. Is it larger or smaller? Atomic radius is bigger as you get closer to big fat francium. So I can ignore this arrow and say smallest to biggest. Eight. They have different amounts of energy, L-I-G-H-T, but they travel at the same speed. So let's go here, okay? Here is some extra credit for you, okay? Two points of extra credit for copying just this top stuff. Higher frequency equals higher energy, and high energy means dangerous, radioactive. So over here, you see how often these lines are going up and down really frequently? High frequencies, gamma rays, those are dangerous. High energy. That's something to memorize, so give yourself extra credit for that. This stuff I wrote here to the sides, I added in in class with my students. I'm not sure if your teachers did, but it's a good idea. Okay, where I said on this side of my electromagnetic spectrum, I have a long frequency, so high frequency. Oh, sorry, long wavelength. I'm pointing to it. Long wavelength, see how long the waves are? Over here, the waves are really short. I said low or short wavelength. And then I said high frequency is over here. They're repeating over here, you're a lot less frequent. And then I put the energies there. So that information should help you answer the first two questions. And then we're going to look at some of these other ones before I give you your last extra credit. Okay. It says number 64 what's the relationship between frequency and energy? And we really said that up here already. High frequency means high energy. So those arrows will both be up over here, or they will both be down over here. Radio waves are safe, and they are infrequent or low frequency. So if the arrows go in the same direction, they get high together and they get low together, direction would be a direct relationship between frequency and energy. They go up together, or they go down together. Number 65, if frequency increases, what happens to wavelength? Well, it says here, low frequency, long wavelength. High frequency, short wavelength. And look at my arrows. I did this. Up, down, down, up. They're opposite. So if frequency goes up, wavelength must be going down. It decreases. If energy goes down, what happens to frequency? Well, we already said that here. Energy and frequency are, go together. So if energy is decreasing, frequency goes in the same direction. It decreases. And then number 67 says, what's the relationship between frequency and wavelength? Unlike this one where they go up together and down together, frequency and wavelength have opposite directions. If one arrow is up, the other arrow is down, or inverted, we call that an inverse relationship. Okay. Go back and watch the video tutorial for pages um, 10 and 11, I think, if you need more help on this type of stuff. Okay. The very bottom. We did this spotlight scientist in class in your notes. If you were absent, just write that you were absent here. You should have this all filled out from that. Um, 
But for your last two points of extra credit, go ahead and write where it says Marie Curie say is awesome. Okay, she she was pretty, pretty hardcore. And if you were there, I hope you guys can appreciate how I don't want to say bad A on a video, right? But she was pretty hardcore. All right, thanks. Good luck on your test.